this is going to be fun. We got uh, we got three local uh, venture capitalists here, and uh, I'm going to get to ask them a bunch of questions about uh, games and VC and um, kind of I'm I'm where I'm headed to is. Um, it's been hard, I think, in, uh, at least in the things I've been involved with. It's been hard to get games and venture capital together. Um, and a lot of the cases where I've seen it work, it's almost been sort of by accident rather than by design. And so I'm, I guess my, my overall goal for this panel is to figure out what we're doing wrong. Because you know, I, think, I think in the cases where I have seen this get together, it's actually worked out pretty well. But we got to figure out how to communicate better or uh, understand each other better. So we're bringing to you guys the kinds of things that you want to see, et cetera. So that's my overall goal. Um, but before we get any farther along, uh, I'd like each of you to introduce yourselves. May, may I start with yeah, I'm, Bill? I'm Bill Bryant. I'm a venture partner with Draper Fisher Jervison out of the uh, Bay Area. But I'm, I'm based here in Seattle. I've been involved with 20-plus uh, startups over the last two decades here in Seattle as in various capacities, a half dozen as a founder. My primary exposure to the gaming uh, space is alongside my colleague here, Tim, we're investors and, and, and Ed on the board of uh, Z2 Live, although this is not hopefully going to turn into a Z2 Live <laughs> promo. Not. Hi, I'm Tim Porter. I'm a managing director at Madrona Venture Group here in Seattle. I've uh, been at Madrona for about six years, and uh, mobile and games has been one area they've been involved in. As Bill mentioned, Z2 Live, another company that Madrona has been an investor in for a long time is uh, Wild Tangent. My partner Greg is on the board there. Um, also look at a variety of B2B software companies, and my life before VC included working in corporate development at Microsoft and working in, in uh, startups here in Seattle. My name is Chris Howard. Sorry to bring this closer. Uh, Chris Howard, I work for Ignition Partners. Uh, um, we uh, have funded a few companies in the gaming space. Uh, Cam Mirvold is a partner at Ignition um, who seed funded, I believe, Wild Tangent uh, when Alex spun out of Microsoft. And he also has been uh, sidelines uh, for Valve. Um, and so he's been uh, personally involved just through his relationship with Gabe. We've made a couple of platform plays uh, in the in the gaming space, we have a company called BlueStacks, which allows you to run your uh, Android applications on Windows or Mac. Uh, so you can imagine the use case for that. There's a lot of people who want to carry their games over. So we've seen a lot of downloads from that company. Another company called Parse, which is a mobile application development platform, which allows game developers to quickly and easily spin up an application. And then we've done a couple of seed investments. Uh, one company called Mino Monsters, which is a Pokemon-like game on iOS and another company called uh, Graffiti Labs, which is uh, developing something between uh, Minecraft meets Zynga. So. Great. And, and did either the other two of you want to mention any other investments that you guys have in the gaming space, or was that, did that pretty much cover it, uh, Tim or Bill? Well, we, uh, Draper Fisher is a worldwide concern. We've got 20-plus offices, so we've got yeah. a number of of investments in a, a China gaming company called Five Minutes. Uh, I, I know there's some things out of the UK as well. So Okay. And Those are our primary ones. We can get into why there hasn't been more historically, but I will say we're actively looking at gaming companies across a number of areas that I'm sure we'll talk about now. Um, and so I don't know how many in the crowd are actually from Seattle or are from here out of area, but, um, you know, we're three VCs. We all are in Seattle, and we're all <laughs> investing in gaming companies. So that might be a little bit of a, you know, dispel some conventional wisdom, right? In those uh, two facts, right there. That might be why I picked you guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So well, you're you're guessing my next question, which is really, uh, really, you know, let's talk about what you're looking for. I mean, what is it about gaming that you guys are excited about? What um, what are you looking for out in the market today? So I'll, uh, I'll start here, and I'm sure uh, augmented by my uh, colleagues here. But you know, first of all, I don't, I don't think venture capital has uh, an, uh, an affection or a uh, disdain for gaming. We're investors. We're trying to identify great companies that, that lead to liquidity opportunities. And what that means is that we have to invest in disruption. And I would say that, and we can come back to this, uh, probably why you haven't seen more dollars flowing toward gaming of late until 
Mobile came along, and I'm sure we're going to touch on that, is that there really hadn't been fundamental disruption, I, I would argue, in gaming for you know quite a while. The early companies, Activision, EA, those were all venture funded, jammed out in early mobile space, but they're just you know in the sort of mid uh, 2000s, not, not much was happening. Um, mobile comes along, it's highly disruptive, it brings a new business model around free to play, a new way of designing games, so they're not so hits driven, if you will, and that's attracted just tremendous amount of investment interest as, as a result, not to mention mobile being such an incredible distribution platform for you know digital products. So I think that, that that's probably a theme that we can really touch on is what, what are the disruptions that are going to be happening in the next five to ten years that are going to lead to great gaming companies emerging and how can we best identify those companies as great yeah that's helpful go ahead I mean I Bill hit it I think the overall issue is that um, historically it was too much of a hits business not that it's not about a hits business anymore but the it, and it's well understood and well documented but the amount of money that needs to be invested to get something out there to begin to try it whether it's on a social platform or on a mobile platform has just come down significantly the amount of time that it takes to iterate between, hey, is this working? How do we test it? Continuous releases make it a lot, uh, maybe not a lot, but makes it easier for a venture firm to sort of assess how things are going. Um, and so, you know, that gets to a little bit, you know, what we look for um, in meeting with teams, and, and we meet with a lot of them. At the end of the day, you have to have a team that you think um, can make a game that people want to play. So from that perspective, you have to have quality IP, um, and it, there is a certain degree of can you create a hit nature to it, but we really want to find um, teams. And I should say Madrone is predominantly Northwest focused, so we're, we're almost exclusively investing in Seattle, Portland, Vancouver, and in and, and those three states. Um, so a little bit, you know, we'll look for a theme and and then try to find a team, you know, in the region that uh, that sort of meets that uh, meets that criteria. But we're really trying to find folks who we think have studied or have experienced um, deeply understanding user acquisition and monetization. They're not just sort of creating games, you know, for, for love of games or for love of design, um, but really understand all the all the challenges and opportunities around, you know, how you can cost effectively acquire customers and then, you know, create a lifetime value that's greater than that acquisition cost. And that, that's sort of the name of the game. Uh, yeah, just adding to it, I mean, I, I think the model has uh, significantly evolved with lower cost of capital to deploy an initial game um, and a lot more resources to get distribution quickly for a lot of these games. And so, um, you know, it's easier for us to put $100,000 to work in a seed funded round where the company is raising a million to a million five and they can get their first or first, first product or first three products out the door and test quickly to understand if they can figure out what is the right product market fit that's going to scale. And then we can layer on additional capital as they need to either push into customer acquisition costs uh, and, and really scale that, or um, if they need to hire, if they need to do a number of other things uh, to get distribution, um, to build new games, things like that. So uh, I think the model's really evolved. It's, it, you know, mm. I pushed for a long time to do <laughs> gaming investment at Ignition, and we finally kind of matched the model to hits-driven businesses. Um, that was the, the main complaint that I heard, why, why we weren't investing in games businesses, because it's hits driven, but so is venture capital. And so you need to figure out <laughs> I'm glad you said that, because I was going <laughs> to ask you that question. <laughs> and so you have to, but you have to figure out the right model to figure out the hits and the right teams to, to, to back. And some of that comes from our own being able to test and iterate and, and figure out what the right model is. So, Yeah, I think the... The fact that you can do interesting things for a, a small number of millions of dollars these days, as opposed to a few years ago, is, is a big point you guys make. Um, the hits-driven thing, as you saw, is is a little trickier for people in the games business to understand because we're, I think we're so used to living in a hits-driven business, and and I think we don't understand what's not hits-driven about venture capital. It's just a different thing you're betting on. Um, I don't know if either of the other two guys want to comment on, on how they think they might be different or whether it's just a, kind of a historical perspective of being more comfortable betting on sort of hits-driven technology versus hits-driven product, uh, I don't know, games. I think, I think uh, venture capital doesn't do well with any kind of creative industry in general. I mean, whether you know, we, we didn't back, you know, book authors, we didn't, don't back bands, we don't back, you know, 
photographers. We just don't have that sort of eye, and we don't think of ourselves necessarily as consumer psychologists, so we mm. understand why you know consumers will do one thing or not. So it was a real challenge when you had to put down you know many millions to see the, the last hole card come up and see if you had a hit or not today in the current environment where um, you know, you're talking hundreds of thousands before you start getting a sense of, of gameplay and mechanics and engagement and you know, all the things that are fantastic about, uh, especially about mobile where you get incredible metrics and uh, that starts to, to, to take away that fear of, you know, of in the old days, building a product, putting it out on the shelf, no hoping that it. it's sold, and <laughs> months later getting some kind of a sell-through report, whether right. you, know, you knew whether, and, and you just, and, and no feedback loop at all. Right. So, uh, so now you have all of those things in place, and so it's created a much better environment for investors to evaluate very, much earlier stage opportunities than would have been the case, you know, 10 years ago. The testing and the feedback loop are, are really key, because in some cases it's not, it's not necessarily less dollars. I mean, it's, it's less dollars to get something basic out and start testing. But where in the older days, you'd have a certain amount of dollars, and then it would take a certain amount of time, and then you'd have to wait to see if anyone liked it, and then it was really tough to change it if there was something wrong with it. And now for a given amount of dollars, it's not that you expect, you know, with testing, every single thing is going to turn out to be a hit. But if something failed, you can fail quickly. You can pull the plug on that. You can move on to the next thing, take your learnings, test it more. Right. So it's, it's not just sheer magnitude of dollars, but it's that time to market, time to iterate, and, and having that feedback loop that I think are, are key in helping us get more comfortable with. Um, but now you guys want to, you all want to wait till you have the metrics, right? <laughs> you don't want to wait till it's at least test launched and so you can see how well it's doing and that, that's what's the, the ARPU That's or a whatever. classic <laughs> challenge. I mean, you know, a, a VC, if they want to pass for some reason, may or may not be because they want to see the metrics, but you can always say you want to see more. Oh, I see. You know, it's right? just a so line. Okay. It, I mean, it, 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 it certainly can There's be. There's always more metrics. Yeah, it's, it, it, cer <laughs> it certainly see, yeah, can be. Right. And, and sometimes it's true for whatever reason, whether it's the team or the category. Yeah. Um, but a lot of times it also comes through and just having that initial conversation with the team, you, it comes across pretty clearly and quickly whether they've lived through it before, yeah. whether they've actually tried to launch something and tested it before, whether yeah. or not it was what they expected to be their, their big game or not. So it can come across in other ways than just seeing the hockey stick because obviously if we always just waited for the hockey stick, we would miss lots of opportunities because you don't need capital anymore or it, you know, at that point it becomes easy to raise capital. I so think it, it, it speaks to culture. Um, so uh, there's kind of an art and a science to launching these games. The art is, can you build a beautiful game? Do you understand game mechanics? Uh, you know, prior experience is great because then you can point to something and say, hey, I actually built that and it launched and we got distribution and that kind of thing. The science is uh, a culture of hypothesis testing. And really what we look at um, when we're talking entrepreneurs is, you know, do they talk in, in, in having a thesis and do they talk about testing, testing, testing to understand what's working, what's not, and quickly moving on from things that aren't working and, and optimizing the things that are. Um, and, you know, the, right now we're in a funny period because a lot of the platforms uh, are, are blocked, so it's really, really hard for you guys to acquire customers on the iOS platform. Android seems a little bit more open at this point, and Kindle is TBD. Uh, I would say that with Facebook, there's some things that they're trying to do to open it back up, but it's, the, it's becoming cost prohibitive to think about those platforms where you can arbitrage, being able to acquire a customer for low cost and be able to plow their um, ARPUs back into acquiring more customers so you grow the platform quickly. So we're kind of in this weird dead zone. A lot mm. of the companies that have been super successful have been able to arbitrage that well, get to scale quickly, and then move more gains through their channel. Um, the, the things that I don't like are looking at uh, people who come in who just clearly think about it as a studio business and not thinking about eventually wanting to own a platform and own enough distribution that you can pipe more games through it. Um, because ultimately you're either a content provider or you're a distribution pipe, and I'd prefer to, to fund the pipe versus the, the content uh, creator, so. Right, and that I, that I think gets to, you know, some of the fundamental differences I think between game developers and, and um, VCs. I mean, one is we've got many years of experience pitching publishers, and publishers, uh, you're pitching generally an A and R person, a, a term from the music business, uh, artist and repertoire. Yeah. But you know, it's somebody who feels like they know a lot about games and can evaluate them. Um, and you guys 
don't feel that way. And, um, and, you're not, and you're never pitching the company, you're pitching the game. You might be pitching the people who are gonna make the game, but you're not pitching the company. And, and the publisher's not investing in the company. So, you know, so, right. so I, I met with a, a little group last week, as I often do, and they, they showed me their new game pitch, and it was a fine pitch, and then they told me they were, it was a pitch for a VC. You know, and I was, they, were, they wanted to go out and raise venture capital, and I just thought, wow. That, I mean, it was, it was I, I hadn't really, it, it became clear to me at that point how different the two things are. You know, that this is a game pitch, it's not at all a, a, a VC pitch. So I wonder if that's part of it. And then when, even when you talk about how things have changed, when you talk about, um, you know, that now we're kind of more uh, metrics driven and all that, but game people still think of themselves as creative. You know? mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean, it's like, I guess, I don't know. I, I guess, I guess, I think a lot of us would would think that if somebody was just purely metric driven, they would probably fail, because they they didn't have the creative part too. That's why it's art plus science, right? It's it's right brain, left brain. So usually there's one person on the team who is creative, who mm -hmm. can design a game, who uh, comes up with the content. They have a, a group of folks that they can pool out to to help generate content more quickly. Uh, to test and iterate, and then you've got somebody on the team who just is a is, is crazy about analytics, and that's all they think about day in day out is setting up the dashboards and figuring out what are the right things to measure. You know, are you measuring day one retention? Are you me measuring day seven retention? What's your thirty week retention? What are your number like? So then you can plow all that back in the game, and and don't do anything until you get your day one retention past thirty per, you know thirty percent or whatever the number is. Right, I, th I think it shifts around by category, but. So, so kind of, so that's good advice. Do you have, do you have more advice to us game people who are used to making publisher re related pitches to come to see you? What, I mean, wh what, how should our pitch be different? What should we emphasize? What should we remove from our pitch? Um, well, I, you know, I've, I've had plenty of those pitches that felt like um, they it was meant for a publisher yeah. and, and you, sort of all you hear about is the game design and why people are gonna love this game and you know, you end up Kind of throw my hands and like I, you know, I don't know if they will or not. It, it sounds cool or it doesn't sound cool uh, to me. Um, so one thing is because it's pretty easy to try something is to just is to get some things out and see what you learn about distribution and being on the Android market or being on the iOS market. Um, you know, pretty easy to do that and to learn some things. Another piece of advice would be to, you know, find somebody to partner with who is more of a business leader who knows something about. Um, consumer software or freemium models or you know metrics driven um, on, on your team you mean? on yeah. the team so yeah. augment the team and you know I will say that you know I, th I think that some of the most successful you know game company leaders do have the ability to, to be both right that they're right. metrics driven and they can evaluate good games and so and it's you know that's art as well trying to find those folks from our end but that's you know those are the kind of, of teams and people we, we would want to back most of all that's something I've noticed. I mean, I think on both in both sets of pitches, the team is really important. You know, experience and history. It's just which part of the history. You know, it's like, oh, I was an art director on these seventeen games, mm -hmm. and you know, you. So with you guys, that's kind of okay. But where's the guy who's going to run the company, right? Mm -hmm. I I would um, also suggest that that um, well, first of all, you know, as investors, we are you know, a mile wide and an inch deep. We, we look at lots of different companies across many, many sectors, and very, very few of us are, have a background out of gaming. In the entire venture capital industry, there are, you know, a half dozen people that grew up in the gaming industry and are now in venture capital. So they have at least some understanding about the, uh, the you know, the, the how games get built and and get distributed. So we sit here and you know, if somebody comes in and says I'm targeting an 18 to 25 year old male, I don't know about the ages of my counterparts, but I'm not an 18 <laughs> to 25 male. I'm not a 14 to 21, you know, female or, I mean, I'm, so I'm, it's, it sounds great, but I don't have any real basis to, you know, say that is something I'm gonna put millions of dollars on. So what I'm looking for, and get to the punchline here is, a differentiated strategy that says, you know, I mean, I, I'll just throw some ideas out. Like, if somebody came and said, we think that the Kindle is gonna be like the gaming platform for the next 10 years, and we've got a team that can build great products and optimize around 
Kindle, we know the, the Amazon, you know, folks and whatever. Uh, you know, you, you, I'd think about that. Uh, I'm, I, uh, HTML5 is going to be the gaming, you know, IDE for the for the next 15 years, and we're all in on that. Okay, I'm, think about that. You see, two live. What was interesting was it was a mobile only gaming company. They were never going to do online. They were never going to do, you know, Facebook. They were never going to do anything else other than mobile, and that was interesting to DFJ. I think it's a really good point. You know, if you're coming to talk to one of us, to be really specific uh, and detail-oriented about your strategy. Like, you don't have to convince me that mobile games are big. You don't have to convince me that there's a lot of tablets and there's going to be more. You don't have to convince me that free-to-play works. So not really interested in top-down major trends that we all know. We want to know super specifically why is your you know game title, different title strategy differentiated. You actually understand the uh, cost to create and deliver that title or that set of titles. Have you studied user acquisition? Who are all the people you've talked to? What's your personal experience? What are the specific? So be very specific about all those things. And, and it, it, that might sound obvious, but you know, I'd say the vast majority of pitches I've been in, it's not the case. The, the whole deck and the whole discussion is going to be about these really high level things. And then when you try to dig into that level of specifics, it becomes pretty thin in a lot of cases. Mm -hmm. That's good feedback. I'll also add that um, it really helps to have a referral from somebody like Ed. Um, and because we are a mile wide and an inch deep, uh, we rely on those people that we've already funded and who have experience building games, who have experience uh, within a particular domain, and we leverage their uh, knowledge and expertise. And so um, the, one of the first phone calls that I'll make uh, if, I, if, if we get interested in a particular game is to one of our current CEOs to say, hey, have you met these guys? Do you know them? Uh, do you think, you know, here, Without violating any confidentiality, you have to do it in such a way where y you can kind of say, here's what's publicly available. Have you heard anything about these guys? And be very generic and broad. Um, but still gather intelligence and, and, and gather and lean on the people who do know what they're doing and have more experience because I've never built a game. I don't know. Uh, but I've seen probably now 150 pitches, maybe 200 pitches, all for games. We funded two companies that are building games that have aspirations to become big platforms and make lots and lots of games that have uh, a whole host of genres and um, so. Great, and that's, that's been a theme uh, through a, a lot of the talks today is, um, is getting connected with people, um, getting introduced through people, that kind of thing. Um, so you, you're building on some things other people said. Um, you know, one thing I, that I think from looking from the outside, uh, from sort of the game perspective, We've seen sometimes that I think the approach the VCs take is actually uh, riskier. Like uh, I look back to um, sort of the MMO craze, uh, you know, and where there was a whole bunch of investment in these MMOs, and it was sort of it, I think it sort of appealed to VC in in some way, some VCs, uh, because it was a platform, not just a game, and it was you know, and when you and from the game people's perspective, it's like wow, you couldn't pick a a riskier thing to, to invest in, you know, it's got all this game risk, it's got all this platform risk, it's very expensive to build, you know, and it seemed like a lot of money went in and just went away. And that, it's because so. Disney bought Club Penguin. I mean, it's like, <laughs> oh, okay. and, and, and we travel why? in packs and you look at something like that, you're like, oh, that must be the next thing. Well, let's go invest in 50 of these. Actually, I remember there was something like $3 billion plowed into the MMO space post the funding of, uh, or the acquisition of Club Penguin. Yeah. I don't know any of those that survived. Right. Right? <laughs> um, there's been a lot of people who kind of, you know, the entrepreneurs themselves who saw ahead of the trend and saw mobile as the next platform, and they invested in building out a lot of the platform functionality, and a lot of that stuff has been acquired. Since then, a lot of other uh, platforms are getting funded right now, right? And um, we funded Parse, which is a, an application development platform for iOS and Android, but it's broader. It's not just for games and and uh, we, you know, we were in Heroku, which was uh, a similar platform, but for web. And we see that trend continuing. But yeah, <laughs> you just have to be careful not to get swept in, swept up in too much of the hype of a particular sector. Uh, yeah, and even well, a couple things. I mean, Z2 Live was originally pitched as a platform. Yeah. Um, you know, it's interesting to think whether you guys would be investors in that game company now if it had originally pitched as a game company. Well, that was an interesting one because it started in our office, and so we yeah. um, kind of were 
uh, part of all that process. And yeah, as, as the VC, we were, my partner and I were more on the build the platform side of things. This was back in 07, 08, 08, I guess, time frame. And um, I guess what we've seen, so that company evolved more towards uh, actually a maker of games. There's still a, certainly a technology platform component, which I think helps them create more games, helps them um, work with third parties if they want to. So there's a definite benefit because of that. I'd say one thing that we've seen in games just in general is that um, there are platform opportunities. We like to evaluate platform opportunities, but most of the money has been made by the people with the games. Right. And so that's sort of one fact, I think. Uh, and then another one is um, if you're going to build a platform, like what's your hook on why people are going to start using it? So whether you're a platform to make it easier and faster to develop games, whether you're a platform around analytics that's going to lead to easier user acquisition and, and, and tracking, whether you're going to be a platform for some other aspect of it, I think you need a really strong value prop to get that flywheel spinning. And, um, and some, some have had that and some haven't. Quite a few, including the Tool I've gra gravitated towards, let's create some of our own games um, to show off the platform, because otherwise sort of no one cares, or you, it's hard to get them to care. And, uh, and then they learned along the way that they could make more money in the interim by, by focusing on that. But these things continue to evolve. <laughs> <laughs> of course. And so, you know, you talk about disruption and, um, and kind of moving in packs and, and uh, mobile. You know, maybe it, I, I know at least one VC on one board I'm on says uh, he's no longer even taking mobile game pitches. He thinks it's too late. Cost of uh, customer acquisition is too high. That 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 gold rush is over. What do you guys think about that? I'll still take the pitch, but I kind of agree. I mean, it was what I uh, yeah. It was you started the point to say made, something which like that. Which is yeah. like you know, the cost of customer acquisition is such that maybe you can't arbitrage it and get to the kind of scale that you want to get to. So maybe there's a different way to structure the deal such that you have a 2x liquidation or 3x liquidation preference in the terms <laughs> such that if the, if the company decides to sell early to a distribution partner, you still make good on your money and you, and you make some return on the capital that you invest. So you may have to shift your model in this time period while we wait for that kind of next platform to emerge. So. Tom would never let you get away know, with sorry, that, right? <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to call you out there, Tom. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what about what about you, you guys? Do you, uh, I, I mean, is mobile done? Is there a new mega trend that, that you guys are more excited about? Is it? I, I mean, I don't think mobile's done. I mean, you know, the the focus, I think, has turned a lot from sort of just pure mobile to maybe more specific to tablet uh, and building tablet first games. Certain categories, you know, social casino has gotten a lot of, you know, thought um, mm -hmm. over, moving more towards a little bit away from casual and more towards mid core, harder core because they, you know, retain and monetize better. I, I think there's, you know, it's still, this, the stats are well understood. It's still early days in the proliferation of all these devices, whether it's, you know, smartphones or tablets. I think there are still new iterations, new models within that. If I knew exactly what all of them were, you know, then it would. <laughs> That, that would be helpful. We don't know all of them. So partly Madrona's model is because we're re more regionally focused, we'll always take the pitch. We love meeting with teams, love talking through these things early on. And um, again, it comes down to differentiation and a hook and you know, seeing that the team has either started to get some success or has a really well thought through thesis for why they can go establish something new kind of within mobile or within mobile plus tablet. Um, not just that, hey, you know, we see you can make these games pretty cheap and we're going to go, you know, make a bunch of them and see what works. Obviously, that's, that's not interesting. Okay. Yeah, m mobile isn't done, but it's, it's certainly not early innings either. It's, uh, you that's know, true. we're in fourth inning or something like that. I mean, the market is just over 50% penetrated in terms of smartphone penetration, U.S. Mm -hmm. number. So that number will get to, you know, 80 Ninety percent over the next several years, and uh, so the the market size will continue to expand. But you are going to have to figure out, you know, something something differentiated on the customer acquisition side in particular. That uh, a lot of the companies out there uh, that we hear are, you know, just you know, when, when lifetime value does not exceed customer acquisition costs, that's not a, a winning proposition for anyone. <laughs> so, um, so you know, you just got to. Uh, coming back to this sort of differentiated strategy, some insight into the market that allows you to 
acquire a, 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 a an audience that you know you can uh, for for some reasonable amount of money that you can you know monetize with the game. That's I think going to be f critically important. Great. Um, let's change gears a little and talk about something. There's a lot of excitement around in the game business right now, and that's uh, you know Kickstarter crowdfunding. Mm -hmm. Is I'm, I'm just curious what the venture capital perspective on that is. Is that is that going to does that take customers away from you? I don't know if you call your investment companies customers, but <laughs> does that does that take potential investments away from you in a in a threatening way, or is it interesting, or I don't know. How do you feel about it? I think it's great. I, mean, I you know I think that uh, let a thousand flowers bloom. We want to invest in the flowers that decide to become great big oak trees. So. If, uh, if you know, there's other sources of capital to get companies kind of kick-started, I mean, that's a, that's, that's a net benefit to us as, you know, venture investors because we're, we're not investing, you know, the $100 that times, you know, 100,000 right. people that might, might uh, you know, we're, we're investing several million. So uh, it's fantastic yeah. and, and might be incredibly appropriate for, the kinds of uh, projects that any creative entrepreneur uh, has. Totally agree. Um, you know, the more uh, interesting projects that get funded or angel funded or, or crowd funded, the better as far as we're concerned. We do invest really early at sort of the quote angel stage sometimes, but we'd be happy to lose some deals to, you know, crowdfunding entrepreneurs gain experience, they have some success or don't have some success, and ultimately to, to Bill's point, you know, to become the, the oak tree or to really scale, you're probably uh, going to come back and, and need to raise some more capital at some point. It's just good for the overall ecosystem. Games obviously are a great candidate for this type of funding. If a lot of, you know, fans uh, who can get behind a concept and are, are happy to fund it that way. So. Um, Maybe some on the, on the margins, you know, there's some fun, there's some disruption for angel investors, I think, frankly, or VCs who go really early. But, hmm. you know, for us, especially in our region, the more funding for early stage companies that happen in this area and others, hmm. we're very happy about that. Yeah, I agree. I think it's a great thing for the ecosystem. Uh, more games means more opportunities to, to learn and, and to uh, find a hit. And uh, if you look at um, AngelList, AngelList has really changed the way uh, we're doing early stage investing where there's a ton of companies that are listed on there that are building games and there's a lot of um, uh, proof and validation and that you have to be referred into AngelList in order to make it into there and then you and then you can as you step back just a sec and explain AngelList for so AngelList is a um, it's basically a platform for funding uh, companies and it allows uh, entrepreneurs to be able to post their um, information their you know description about your team. Uh, description about the product, the market, and to be able to go in and, and hand pick the investors that you want to meet with and facilitates the meetings uh, uh, and getting you introduced to investors. Um, you have to be introduced, I believe, by another uh, investor into the system. Um, and then, you know, there's uh, mechanisms to, to help you find investors. And um, the transparency that, that that's provided to the investment process on both sides has been phenomenal. Um, it's also the way OUYA leaked. Uh, a, a journalist went on to AngelList and found uh, information about the OUYA project before it was public. Okay. And uh, so that's going to be interesting to see how that might affect that, that yeah. going forward. Yeah, and you know, speaking to some of the risk that you've, you've pointed out where venture capitalists you know, are, are uh, a little reticent to invest in games, or some are, um, I think it's great because uh, you're going to have more companies created. Uh, Kickstarter. I haven't seen very many games uh, being, you know, I went and did a quick search before this panel and looked at iOS apps on Kickstarter. I think there were five, maybe 10. I've seen it's, more. It's a very PC oriented crowd. Okay. Yeah. In fact, there was a, a project, um, Republic from around here, uh, a group called Camouflage, and they had to switch their pitch halfway through to also include a PC skewer. It wasn't going to get okay. funded. Once okay. they did that, they were successful. Yeah. I was going to say it, it tends to correlate with something that you can have in your hand or pre-order, right? And yeah. for a 99 cent app or, you know, 3.99 cent, I don't know, you know, what the numbers look like versus a PC game. I think pricing tends to be a little bit higher. So there's, there's some interesting, you know, 
match of the audience versus what's being funded on there, you know, over time, will more and more games be developed that way? Sure. Now, I, I'm definitely not an expert in this, but uh, there was some sort of changes passed in a, a bill recently in Congress. Um, you're nodding your head, so I, I should probably shut up at this point and let you talk about it. But <laughs> it basically made it easier for you to do basically crowdsourced investing. Um, uh, maybe so, in other words, right now you can't on Kickstarter take, uh, you, people are just making donations. They can't actually become investors in the company and benefit in future growth of the company or whatever. Um, how does, does that change anything or is that also great? <laughs> I mean, I, I know about Jobs Act made it Jobs easier Act, to do yeah. these things. I'm not deep enough on it to be able to, yeah. you know, tell the audience exactly how to go take advantage of it. But the, I mean, the general trend from the regulatory standpoint is to make this easier, easier for more entrepreneurs and early stage company to get capital from more sources, remove barriers to do that. That's the, that's the overall point. Yeah, I think TBD. It, I think this. Right. I think it's Don't supposed know. to take effect sometime this fall. In January. Oh, January. I believe it takes place in January, yeah. Okay. You know, there's some risk as an investor uh, when you look at a cap table uh, for a company that has been crowdfunded. Right. Um, with, if you know, if you have hundreds of investors that you've taken money from, it gets a little spooky because, you know, as a professional investor coming into the round and, you know, you're putting large, uh, larger sums of money uh, into a company, potentially. I mean, I don't know. There may be some crowdfunders out there who want to put write a million-dollar check, but I think they're going to tend to be smaller check sizes. And so when you're writing a five to 10 to $20 million check, seeing all those investors, there's a lot of work that you're gonna have to do to kind of uh, um, just make sure that there aren't any conflicts, right? And uh, I think like the, the models for VC firms have evolved where more and more people have been doing earlier stage investments just because the market landscape has shifted, so too will they shift as more and more uh, individuals become uh, crowdfunders. And we just have to figure out how to adapt to it. And yeah, I mean, we'll people are already worried about fraud and Kickstarter. And now when it becomes investing, it's small amounts from lots of people could be even more scary, I think. Has anyone here used crowdfunding for a project successfully or unsuccessfully? There's one hand. Two. Two. Great. <laughs> Bill, did you have anything you want to add on that? Uh, no. OK. Um, now, I, I, I don't know. I, I think. You know, there's sort of this stream I think some developers have. They look out at some of these companies. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not familiar enough with Rovio. I know most of the funding came from the dad. Um, but, um, but Minecraft is an interesting one where, you know, they, they really just took money from fans completely. I mean, not even through Kickstarter. And it just, the entire thing grew organically. And it's certainly, I think you would, you'd have to call it an oak now. I mean, it's probably brought in $100 million in profit, um, uh, so that's not bad. Yeah. Um, so it's going it's to be interesting as things change. As you get digital distribution, more direct communication with customers, how that affects uh, funding models going forward. Best kind of funding is revenue, right? Yeah, so, absolutely. I mean, that's, yeah. what, that's what the guys in Minecraft did very well. That's right. Uh, uh, and, and put their product to market and iterated very quickly and let the community build it and you know, uh, it took off from there, and that's the best kind of funding. Okay, great. Um, I'm going to open it up now and get some questions from the crowd. I bet we got a bunch of people who want to pitch you here. So, <laughs> yeah, go ahead. That's practically a pitch. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel like I should. No, 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 I, 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 I want the answer. I'm not looking for the answer. I'm teasing. No, I feel like I should ask back to you what your what your point of view is on it. Obviously, I've thought uh, thought fairly deeply about it. You know, so we've only looked at it a little bit, right? And um, you know, my sense is that even short of getting into cash-based games, there's been good monetization data that various folks have had on mobile platforms, on Android, different types of approaches here. And so 
I think the attractive part, even short of cash gaming, is just that um, it retains well, it monetizes well. You still have, and maybe even more so now because there's been a lot of new entrants, the discovery problem and how do you stand out and how do you, de how do you differentiate. So if anything, that might even be harder. But I think if you can start to acquire users, the monetization aspects are attractive. I think the longer term you know, possibility of changing back or to converting into real money gaming at some point is just really hard to handicap. I, you know, I, I haven't personally sort of you know, dug deeply into all the in intricacies of that, but the, the bit that we, we've looked at it is that it's, there's just a lot of unknowns and it's gonna take, it's gonna take time. That's probably some unsatisfactory answer, but. No, 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 we have I, more. We have yeah. panel tomorrow here. Okay, great, good, okay. Great. So mm -hmm. I should have asked you the question. <laughs> okay, great, great. I know uh, DFJ, we have a, uh, a policy where we will not invest in online gambling. So we yeah. just, period, so we just don't do it. Uh, we, clo we looked at a company that was providing authentication services for offshore gambling, and mm -hmm. that was incredibly profitable, but we <laughs> couldn't do that deal either just because of that exposure. So, you know, if and when the U.S. gets around to legalizing online gambling. We'll then you might change. Yeah. Yeah. All right, there was a hand behind, yeah. Um, if you guys were starting uh, your own business today, would you look at Kickstarter or would you try and do your own uh, funding? Uh, would you go for investor funding or would you go the Kickstarter route? Or something like that? <laughs> you know, I, it, 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 if I was starting a company right now, I would need some other people with me to help me write the game, and I would try to find a group that we could. Um, have enough of our own capital to get as far as we can bootstrap to get something out there to kind of prove to ourselves that we found a niche and that I could then, um, you know, either take to investors or, or show some more traction, you know, in, in evidence on whatever funding source. So I guess the short answer is I'd bootstrap as, as long as I can and, and try to start generating some revenue and, and then go from there. What was, what did you say? He, he said so like the Minecraft approach. I, I'm not yeah. sure that's quite what you mean, but it's an example. Um, I think the answer would be, you know, are you trying to build a game or are you trying to build a business? If it's a game, I just find the lowest friction source of capital and assemble that and get it done. And if you're trying to build a long-term business that's going to require, you know, a significant amount of capital, then probably explore um, other sources because, I, you know, Kickstarter – will you know, provide some amount of money, but it's not gonna provide any kind of scale up or expansion capital for you, so. Yeah, go ahead. Can a venture capitalist implement managerial control over the companies that they invest in? Do we have managerial control? Managerial control. Well, I, I don't think any of us wanna operate anything, so <laughs> we, we try not to have managerial <laughs> control. There's usually a seat on the board which has yeah. some influence. Yeah. So do you guys want to add anything beyond that? Typ typical model is a minority investment, one board seat, where you're involved and try to be helpful, but not beyond that. If we're operating the business, there's a problem. Like we're, we're funding great operators, right? And, and most, I don't know if you, uh, you, you guys all have operating backgrounds. I have an operating background. Uh, but you wouldn't want me in operating your business on a day-to-day -day basis. Like, like Bill said, we're a mile wide and an inch deep, and we're telling you how to run your business. There's probably something wrong, um, and we rely on the entrepreneur to build their business and to find the right talent to put around the table. If it if it looks like you need, you know, expertise in a particular domain area, we'll probably try and go find somebody to add to the team, or bring in a board advisor, or surround you with a group of uh, like-minded entrepreneurs who you can learn from. Um, and trying to augment your expertise versus us trying to do that and do it on a day-to-day -day basis just wouldn't be wouldn't work. So there was an article uh, that was recounting uh, Mark Pincus's comments on Yuri Milner, the uh, Digital <laughs> Sky technology guy who invested in Zynga. He said it was the perfect investor because he had never been to a board meeting, <laughs> he had never asked a question ever, and had consumed absolutely no management bandwidth whatsoever. Except when he was asked, "Can you introduce me to you know some guy in Russia?" And he was fine with that. But <laughs> all right, I know this question over here. Go ahead. Uh, what's the typical time horizon to exit for your investment? I mean, does that change at all based on investing in you know, you know, certifications and different sort of 
Typical uh, time horizons for venture investments are eight to 10 years. It's grown uh, over the last 10 years. Uh, it was, you know, in the kind of four to six year range, it's now eight to 10. Um, you know, I don't think there's, uh, games are necessarily faster or shorter than that. Um, uh, it just depends, so. Yeah, we wouldn't approach it, a game company any different than any other investment. Always assume it'll be that long or longer try to build companies for the long term. And if you focused on that, if, you know, if there's an exit opportunity that came beforehand that everyone felt good about, you know, that's something you'd consider, but it never works to try to play for a shorter term horizon in our experience. Yeah, go ahead. So um, uh, two parts. Uh, first, uh, if we have Ed on our board, are we more likely to get funding? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> The triple screen has always been a big promise that you can move a game across whatever platform and we invest in a company called BlueStacks that allows you to do that, move from an Android device to Windows or Mac. Um, but in startups, focus wins, right? And so would rather hear a pitch where you come in and you say, hey, we're gonna focus on this one thing and do it really well and then move across platform versus coming in, I mean, and, and maybe have the dream to do that and talk about how you're gonna do that, but what's your wedge, right? And uh, that all comes down to customer acquisition, right? And so where are you going to acquire a large enough pool of users to be able to move across platforms? Right, but not just platform being the product itself. It's say, channels like toys, um, yeah. shirts, that type of thing. Right? Yeah. Uh, yes, will fund, have funded, yes. It's riskier. I mean, we, um, we don't like uh, hardware generally, because there's a lot of capital risk included in hardware, um, and so tend to focus on uh, software-focused companies. Uh, but if you have dreams of doing hardware, there are partners who know how to do that really well and maybe bring them in as a licensing partner or a you know potential investor in the business down the road once you figure out the software piece and you have the, the business mapped. I mean, Rovio didn't add plush toys until they had significant amount of distribution, right? right. But now they're doing that, and you know, whatever else they're doing with Hollywood and when it makes sense and when it's appropriate. But I don't, I, I wouldn't, and I don't know about you guys, but I, I think twice about investing in a hardware first business that walked in with a pitch and said, hey, we're gonna build this thing and we're gonna take it to market, which is actually where Kickstarter does very well. So if you wanna do that, go to Kickstarter, potentially. So. I can probably squeeze in one more question if, if we've got one out there. Probably not gonna get a better chance to talk to these guys. Yeah, go ahead, Tom. Yeah, um, you know, it, it seems, uh, it, it kind of reminds me with publishers, as you, you guys are talking about, you really want the next big thing, and you're very risk adverse at the same time, which seemed to me a, a bit conflicting. So I'm, I'm sure if not, you'd come to me with Minecraft, you would want to get out of here. And, and I wonder if, uh, and you're talking about what I think are pretty much uh, platforms that are done. Uh, certainly iOS is uh, it's very incredibly hard to break at this point. Uh, so. But I, I do have an example I want to ask you about, and if, if you're looking at it and what you think, and that is, I hate to go back to PCs, I guess you guys may think we're dinosaurs, but there's a company out there called Wargaming.net. They have a free-to-play game. Uh, according to Victor, the CEO, they're cracking uh, eight figures a month. And those numbers are the kind of things that you, I know you guys have to pay attention to, or you should be. And I'm just wondering what you think about it when you have what apparently is things like wargaming and, the, and the, uh, even the, the, the slowly dying dinosaurs of the uh, massive multiplier subscription model. Uh, how do you, how do you uh, try to get in front of that curve while you don't see it until after it happens? I'll just add Tom's a lawyer, so he has no problem expressing his <laughs> point of view. <laughs> No, I, I, did, I, I thought it was a little blunt. I didn't think it was long. I don't know. I, I'm not sure that's an answerable question. I mean, I, I um, you know, 
interesting in how you asked the question that certain platforms are done or harder to crack, yet other platforms that people previously said were done, there's new opportunities. So right. I think in all of those, we're mm -hmm. constantly trying to find what those new opportunities are, whether it's new innovation and in something people had previously written off, and you know the contrarian investments typically tend out to tend to be the best, and you you know it's hard to try to go to go find those and identify those, um, and I guess you know I'm well aware why you know we come off as risk averse and want to see more metrics and this and that, but there's a you know there's a hopefully a method to the madness a little bit, and we you know we're we're still um, you know like we said earlier looking. For for hits and we're wrong, you know, more often than we're right. So I wouldn't say risk averse, right? It's trying to find the right set of ingredients across all these things we're talking about. And so all of those things you mentioned would be, you know, things we'd be interested to go, you know, try to learn more about and get in front of. The reason why we're risk averse is that more often than not, we're wrong, even <laughs> after we do all of the diligence and all of that, right? So, and you know, the likelihood of any one entrepreneur actually executing against what they're talking about when they're just pitching us, is low. I mean, it's like 5% of the companies actually even form up, right? So we are risk averse because there are lots of things that are in front of a company to, to, to get it going. So, but I was going to uh, answer it a little bit differently that, you know, you, I think we got to remember that, you know, we were on another panel just an hour and a half ago, and I was just reminded that, you know, iOS, that's five years old, okay? Five years old. So had you had the foresight to say this is a fundamentally new platform and I am going to go all in on that you know four years ago not today <coughs> not that's not that long ago you know you you would have had a, <coughs> a good opportunity for you know funding so what is I don't know what that next thing is or this gentleman here was talking about connected devices and I was thinking oh, you know maybe there's something there that there's some gaming company that's really going to pull together a game that moves from mobile to a tablet to a PC to a 72-inch, you know, TV monitor. I mean, that that could be interesting as well. But I don't know. You know, you tell me what the world will look like in five years, and you know, if we can come to agreement, we'll have an investment. There, you do see a shift happening in <coughs> the venture <coughs> business where you see more funding going to really, really early stage companies and and being seeded. It's kind of this bifurcation where. Uh, they get seeded or they're raising massive, massive, massive rounds of funding, right? And there's, a, there's kind of a uh, gap in the middle where the Series B companies get <coughs> stuck uh, a lot of times where they haven't really proven the model, they haven't really been able to scale, but yet they still need to go raise another, you know, five to ten million dollars to continue iterating on the game. And a perfect example of that is a company called OMG Pop, right? They did, you know, for the, they, they were doing, first it was a dating site, then it became a gaming site. Then it became about um, synchronous gaming. Then it became asynchronous gaming. Then it became a mobile game. Like, look, <laughs> and, and and you know, I think there's a lot of investors out there who passed at a Series A and Series B because they just, you know, they didn't necessarily believe. They didn't have the metrics for whatever reason, right? And then they hit it, right? And whoever that Series B investor, I think Spark was in the round. I think there's you know a few other folks. There's I know a few of the seed investors. Um, they did very well. Right, and you know, it, it's hard to predict, and so that's why you see this bifurcation. And you know, let's go do uh, ten seed investments all around gaming, and have a thesis, and you know, try and follow some of these rules that we create for ourselves. But you know, there's going to be a bunch of people who break the rules, and you might need to reserve some capital to fund those too, right? So, perfect. Thank, thank you, guys. That's a good. That's a good place to end. You guys have been great sports. And thanks to everyone for coming. I want to thank again um, our, our two major sponsors, Intel and Unity. And uh, be sure to come tomorrow morning, 9 a.m. Uh, I'll be up on stage interviewing the CEO of Ouya about this crazy Ouya console. So you don't want to miss that, 9 a.m. tomorrow. <laughs>